Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining from in the world. My name is James Ellsmore. I'm the CEO of Island Innovation, and I'd like to welcome you to the third and final day of this event. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this session today entitled Small Island States, Climate Risk, Public Debt, and the SDGs. We'll be covering, as you can see, a, a wide variety of issues impacting um, small island states at the macroeconomic level. Um, just before we go ahead, I'll be sharing a poll just to hear where everyone is joining from and just take a few moments to fill that out. And just a reminder, if you haven't already, for anyone able to join us, we are having the Island Innovation a Blue Economy Investment Forum taking place in person on the island of Madeira, Portugal, uh, later this year in June. Uh, you'll be receiving an email about this too, but everyone who is signed up to the Island Finance Forum has a chance for a discounted ticket available until the end of today, and a link will be appearing shortly in the chat on that. So if you are able to join us and the topics discussed during this week are of interest to you, then we do hope we'll be able to see you there in person. Um, okay, I can see people have filled in the poll. Just take one moment more if it's in front of you. Um, we have a lot of people joining, about 25% from Europe, um, and then a mixture of others, um, about, oh, a third from the Pacific. Okay, that's the strongest Pacific presence. That makes sense, given our panelists in Fiji, um, or some of our panelists, I should say. We have a good representation from the private sector, but also government and NGOs. And then the biggest uh, industries are environmental services and um, energy taking place. So fantastic. With that, I would like to introduce our moderator for the panel, Zadie Afrin. Zadie is one of our Island Innovation Ambassadors. She's been a very active participant in our program um, over the years. And I'd like to thank her especially for all her hard work in bringing this panel together. Um, very much looking forward to this, Zadie. Hope all is well in Fiji. And over to you. Thank you, James. To all my listeners, we will kickstart the session. And um, today, I would like to highlight to you that some of our speakers, uh, who are they? They are special advisors to UN. They are advisors to high-level government officials, such as ministers. They are advisors to financing projects. And uh, not taking too long, uh, we'll be covering four thematic areas today. One is at the global level, which is at the UN Capital Development Fund. Then we will move to straight into from UN at country level, at local government level. And then we will be discussing some of the strategy that these uh, uh, strategic advisors are uh, discussing with us uh, for you to be able to help localize SDGs and uh, move into policy discussions and debates. So not taking much time, I would like to introduce you to my first speaker, Mr. Krishnan, who has been a specialist uh, right under the UN Capital Fund. Over to you and let's get the session started. So, um, and uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, James and uh, and uh, Lexidi. And also, I'd like to uh, send warm regards to all the participants of this forum, wherever they are. Uh, once again, Bulavanaka to people in Fiji. Uh, so, my name is Krishnan. I head the Pacific Insurance and Climate Adaptation Program. And and uh, I also, I'm, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm also responsible for the global program on uh, climate disaster risk financing and insurance for the UN Capital Development Fund. Uh, I'll give you a brief about the UNCDF. So UNCDF is a very specialized agency of the UN, which has uh, in its name uh, uh, the word capital development. So it has an investment mandate. It's the only UN agency that can deploy blended financing instruments, namely 
uh, performance based grants loans and guarantees i'll i'll come to uh, for further details on that and this particular program that we are implementing in the pacific for the last uh, two years so focusing on um, uh, impact of climate change and uh, natural hazards uh, is to uh, uh, the main objective of this program is to improve the financial preparedness of uh, the Pacific SIDS towards economic impacts of climate change and natural hazards. And it's an insurance and finance response mechanism that improves the resilience and preparedness of local communities against uh, extreme, uh, I mean, extreme weather events. Uh, these are uh, predominantly market-based climate risk insurance uh, products and solutions uh, and aimed at low-income households and communities, uh, MSMEs, cooperatives, and agri-agencies uh, across uh, the sectors and segments that are mentioned there. Uh, I mean, agriculture, fisheries, MSMEs, and, uh, and tourism. Uh, it's a joint program that we are implementing with the UNDP and the UN University based in Bonn. Uh, the approach and strategy that UNCDF has taken for this program, and this is applicable for all our inclusive digital economy programs, is uh, working across four, uh, four work streams, namely empowering customers to take informed decisions, uh, educating customers on uh, importance of financial literacy and insurance. Then the, the other work stream uh, is on uh, establishing digital ecosystems for last mile reach. And uh, as you would know, in uh, many small island developing states, these are hard to reach populations, very remote and rural areas with uh, limited uh, uh, like connectivity. Uh, so therefore, we are working with uh, telcos and uh, with the uh, mobile network operators in terms of creating the ecosystem that is required for last mile reach. And then in terms of inclusive innovation, the products and solutions that are developed are uh, totally evidence-based, uh, uh, co-created with the community, co-created with the beneficiaries, uh, so that the, the solutions are inclusive. And last but not the least, uh, the work on uh, policy and regulation is largely working with the central banks of the region and with the with the with the, with the ministries of uh, finance and and other relevant government departments in creating a conducive environment for deployment of such solutions. So there's a lot of ecosystem activities that goes behind. Uh, what we do. Uh, the inception phase of the program covered uh, Fiji, Vanuatu, and Tonga, where uh, market-based uh, parametric microinsurance products are already available. And the expansion phase, which has just started this year, will see us expanding to Samoa, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and also to Kiribati. Uh, there's also a global expansion plan to certain, certain markets in Africa and in the Caribbean. Uh, and that is based on our experience in the Pacific and our uh, on-the-ground presence in these countries. Um, the focus is uh, primarily on developing climate disastrous insurance solutions for uh, cyclonic storms, uh, droughts, and flooding. And uh, some of these products are already available uh, through the local insurance companies in uh, Fiji, namely Fiji Care, Sun Insurance, and Tower, which is a regional insurer and also in Vanuatu through VanCare. Um, these are products that are market-based and are available for immediate cash liquidity to be provided uh, to affected communities if they are insured. Um, so what is special about the program and what is special about uh, what we do and how does it help uh, uh, in, in uh, reaching SDGs? So one is uh, there is a huge private sector leverage. So because the program directly works with the insurers, local insurers, and global reinsurers to design, test, and scale of financing solutions. Focus is on implementing uh, at the micro and the meso levels because when we started the program, we started with the baseline of zero. There were no products or solutions available uh, for, for extreme weather events. Uh, now I'm happy to say that these three markets have, uh, I mean, approximately five products on offer. Uh, and then what does UNCDF do is to complement the technical assistance that is provided to partners with uh, blended financing instruments, including loans and guarantees and performance-based grants. Uh, a lot of our work is uh, on digital solutions uh, and localized aggregation models, which drive scale. Uh, and there's a deep collaboration with governments and, uh, and the policymakers, including a, a, a regulatory sandbox approach that uh, we have with the Reserve Bank of Fiji. And this enables uh, a collaborative approach and an industry dialogue. 
And all the work that we do is backed by a solid, uh, solid evidence. We have partnered with the USP to do uh, uh, like client-facing research, which, uh, which, which, which informs the decision making. So this is the ecosystem of partnerships that we have put together in the Pacific so far. Uh, largely in Fiji, but also in uh, countries like Vanuatu and Tonga. So you will you will find that UNCDF plays the role of a catalyzer, but the other ecosystem players have a significant role to play, and that has led to uh, a, a, a very good deployment of the products that are already there. Uh, I briefly talk about the blended financing uh, that I uh, spoke about. So this is the uh, investment continuum that uh, UNCDF supports. So uh, the first circle is basically on the grants and the technical assistance component one. In the initial stage of development, uh, the private sector and other players require uh, grant capital and, uh, and technical assistance. And then over the period of the pilot and establishment of proof of concept, they can then move to uh, like concessional debt or equity, where again, UNCDF can make investments. We were very strategic but those for projects that directly have a link with SDGs. And then once this phase is over, uh, they can access commercial finance from, uh, from the market, local or global. Uh, I think I'll stop here uh, and I'm happy to take any questions later. Uh, this initiative is uh, funded by the donors that are on display. Uh, by the governments of New Zealand, Australia, the India UN Development Partnership Fund, and the uh, government of Luxembourg. Thank you. Thank you, Krishnan. Was a very quick brief and condensing such a high level uh, a development program, especially financing for our listeners. And to my listeners from all um, different range of uh, disciplines, you can see that uh, blending finance and trying to incorporate climate change, climate risk into budgeting really require a multidisciplinary, multifaceted uh, stakeholders. I would like to summarize very key things that um, you can take for the next session is that inclusive innovation. And either whether it's the UN projects or government projects, if inclusivity is not there, all the project implementers are gonna face serious problems. So thank you for highlighting inclusivity. And just to quickly uh, help others understand, since we are talking about localizing SDGs, climate SDG is climate uh, SDG 13, needs to be integrated with um, SDG 9, which is uh, innovation and uh, infrastructure, and financing them together to meet the climate needs of island countries, which Krishnan has highlighted, are some of the uh, projects interventions that is going on. Now, for policymakers, it's important to know that these are not concrete answers, but what we are sharing with you today is called proof of concepts. Now, I'm going to take you to our next speaker. Farida, and you will be hearing the proof of concept at the local level at Malmo, Sweden. Over to you. Thank you so much. Let's get this there. Thank you so much, uh, Saidi, uh, James, and Krishnan for a very interesting presentation. And my name is Frida Gottnier Leander, and up until one year ago, I worked for the city of Malmo in Sweden. Uh, Malmo is the third biggest city in uh, Sweden and it has about 350,000 inhabitants. So in a global perspective, it's quite a small city. Anyway, my title uh, in the city of Malmo was sustainability strategist and SDG coordinator at the city office. And uh, about one year ago, I started my new position and as a senior consultant at Rumble Management Consulting. And just to give you a quick, quick overview of Rumble, uh, it is a part of Rumble Management Consulting is part of the larger Rumble group, which is owned by the Rumble Foundation. In total, we have 300 offices in 35 countries across the globe, uh, where 30 of them are for Rumble Management Consulting. And um, we at uh, 
the management consulting are advisors within social, environmental, and economic sustainable change. We have customers from both public, private, and civil society sector, and we work in all parts of the of the transformation processes uh, from policy to implementation and follow up. And we work multidisciplinary across markets, building waters, uh, water, energy, architecture, and landscape, and so on. Um, but I'm here to tell you about the work we did in, uh, in the city of Malmo. Um, we were, or the city of Malmo was an early adopter of the UN 2030 agenda. In 2015, the mayor of Malmo committed to localizing the SDGs and using them as the guiding star for the city's development. So with this clear direction from our political leaders, our process to localize the SDGs started with a dialogue across all parts of the organization and city, admi city administration. Participation and joint ownership of the SDGs were key to us. Uh, as Christian called it, co-creation and involvement uh, were very important. And MAMA's sustainability office, where I worked, was established in 2017. And among many other things, we hosted workshops and conducted interviews with represent, uh, representatives from the city's 14 departments and municipal companies. We uh, started a MAMO 2030 lab, also with representatives from each department, and um, it resulted in 2018 uh, in a strategy for the long-term implementation, uh, which, as I will tell you, led up to a yearly sustainability report monitoring the SDGs on a local level, and then integration into the budget process. And finally, uh, in 2021, we did the voluntary local review, um, which we presented to uh, the HLP, a high-level political forum in July in 2021. Um, so the strategy for long-term implementation had five main processes. The first one um, were very clear, was very clear to us uh, on all of the people participating integration in existing steering management systems and processes. So we didn't want the, the SDG uh, strategy to be something uh, on the side. We needed to integrate it into the existing systems. The second one, a sustainable development through operational development. It had to do with sustainable impact assessment and um, decision making. Uh, making sure that decisions were based on uh, assessment of, of sustainability. Um, and we, uh, before I stopped, uh, before I finished my position in Malmo, we started to develop a tool for this as well, a sustainable impact assessment tool. Third one was communication and participation, and it's about learning, uh, constantly developing uh, knowledge and support. Knowledge and awareness uh, is very well connected to this. Uh, to make change, we need, we need to constantly uh, increase our knowledge and awareness. What is sustainability and why? It's also about uh, behavioral change. Um, the last one, innovative, partnerships, part of the SDG 17. We no one actor can, can make the change uh, by themselves. So we need to partner up. And one of the most important, or maybe the most important, and the, the one strategy that I had most uh, focused most on is the first one, integration into existing steering and management processes. And since uh, the budgets, of a municipality, a city, is an overarching steering document that all departments must follow. The budget's potential for seriously localizing the SDGs and turning them into the long-term vision of the city became very clear to us. So we asked ourselves, how can the SDGs play a role in the budget process of the city? And we were very lucky in timing because the budget process were, was up for a review and uh, revising. And we seized this unique moment, we could say, to collaborate 
closely with the economic and financial department of the city to find a way to integrate the SDGs into the budget process and making this important document the city's top tool for steering its action towards the SDGs and ensuring a concrete action plan to localize the agenda. But uh, this integration didn't happen in one year. It took two years after the mayor committed to the SDGs in 2015 until the SDGs were first mentioned in the budget. Then subsequent budgets con concretized this ambition. So it was in need of a series of uh, political decisions to pave the way towards the integration of the agenda into the Malmo's, into the budget of the city of Malmo. And among these decisions just was one very important to start monitoring the SDGs in the city's yearly sustainability reports. So from uh, 2020, the SDGs are the long-term goals in the city's budget. And uh, we even informally called our budget, the local agenda 2030 plan. This is a, uh, an illustration of the budget process um, or the Malmo model, as we call it. When it works as intended, it catalyzes a dialogue with all parts of the city administration uh, to formulate and prioritize goals and targets. And it sets the monitoring and following, following up process on progress and challenges through the sustainability report. The model integrates the uh, uh, S SDGs into the budget and management systems of the city and provides methods to institutionalize the city's SDG pledges. So we have 13 city council goals. Uh, so that the SDGs are the overarching, the vision, and then the 13 city council goals in the budget reflect the city's biggest and most complex challenges identified by the annual sustainability report. And uh, the sustainability report ba is based on a little more than 100 indicators. Um, and these are identified both from the, the, the SDGs themselves and the national indicators, and then dialogues between different departments uh, across the city. And to keep us accountable and to ensure that the budget uh, delivers on commitments based on the challenges laid out by the sustainability report, we consistently uh, apply reporting and analysis in the various elements of the budget process. And this informs the preparation of the next budget cycles. And the budget cycle is four, year, four years in, the, in Sweden, in Malmo. And before each, each new term, there, there is a la large or a very extensive sustainability report. And then, between every budget year uh, within the four year term, there's a lot of reporting and analysis as well. Yes, so what have we learned and what can we um, give advice to, to other uh, local communities or governments that want to integrate the SDGs? Well, that it takes time. Um, I mean, it's quite uh, early still uh, that Malmo started with this and, it's still hard to say what effect it had it has had on sustainability and development in in Malmo. But so, moving from ambition to integration into budget systems, and then finally to action and performance review, it takes time. Um, one area of development in the city of Malmo is that I mentioned impact assessment. We need to get better at understanding what our actions lead to and what consequences different decisions lead to. So uh, at Ramble, my, my current workplace, we have developed the Ramble Sustainability Assessment Framework, which I think could help many organizations, including Malmo, to make more informed decisions and to measure the effects of our decisions. Secondly, um, an important area of development is increasing the strategic um, or the third one here is strategic cooperation between administrations to break down the silos, as we usually say. We see this as a challenge at almost all our customers in Rumble and in all sectors. The budget process help, can help this cooperation between uh, different parts of the organization, but it's still a way to go, uh, even in Mamo. 
Fourthly, uh, building sustainability into budgetary processes requires clear leadership that makes sustainable development that, that puts the sustainable development and the SDGs on at the top of the agenda uh, of, and of every discussion between departments and committees when it comes to goal setting and targeting. Lastly, it is a long-term commitment, so the city budget remains short-term uh, and only value uh, valid during the four-year terms of term of office. So, the long-term horizon of the SDGs will re require to make even long longer-term commitments that influences not just our budget but also the regulations, the policies, the programs, and uh, and uh, national law as well uh, and recruitment system so so we need to work in, in many many uh, areas and uh, from different um, perspectives and angles to make this happen and really make a difference thank you uh, that was it from me and i um, would be very uh, happy to hear from you uh, in the future thank you Thank you, Farida. It was uh, nice to get to the question of where taking budget seriously at the local government level. If we really want to see SDGs getting implemented, budgeting at local level and at country programming levels has been now seen the key directions for implementers to move on. And I hope uh, our listeners have been able to understand uh, from the Malmo case, what it takes, but a leadership is critical from at all levels, from the UN level to our leaderships at local government level, such as our mayors and the, the team that they build to, to localize SDGs. Um, happy to take any questions if we have here. Uh, if not, we will be moving forward. Um, to our next speaker and again this is following the same um, same category to advise policy makers as we heard from our first listener that we are relying on un capital fund which means investments from un our malmo story or sweden shows local government and national government also needs to just start their process by uh initiating their own budgets. Now we're going to move to join SDG funds. And this is going to build on from what uh, you have had from Malmo, how join SDG projects are bringing different UN agencies together to fund and localize SDGs. So I'm going to hand over this to our colleague from the join SDG, Mr. Sergio Navas, over to you. Thank you. Uh, we need your uh, speaker. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I was on mute. Good, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And my name is Sergio. I'm working in Cabo Verde for the UN. It's a country that is on the Atlantic, on the west coast of Africa. And I, I'm working here in the UN Resident Coordinator Office and supporting the, the mobilizing funds for the country, for achieving the SDGs. I would like to share with you an example that we have been done with the joint SDG fund. Okay. The joint SDG fund is, uh, was created by the Secretary General of the UN in 2017. And the idea is to, uh, it's, it's an innovative instrument to incentivize the, the transformation policies, but also to catalyze the strategic invest, investment to uh, lead the, the sustainable development goals. As you can see on the on the screen, there are several implementing uh, uh, partners and uh, agencies and donors. So the so it is a, uh, the government lets the, the the preparation of of the 
pro of the catalytic program of projects, but it is implemented by the UN agencies. Uh, until now, there's more than 239 million dollars uh, in, in, in projects investing in the, in, in the country. The, the mandate of the of the of the joint SDG fund that is a is the global level is to align global financial system with the SDG so that the investment uh, of the of the international financial and uh, financial uh, system but also of the national resources are aligned with the SDG so we can achieve the the 2030 agenda and as you can see here uh, the, there is a few elements uh, and, and key SDG transformation areas in which the joint SDG fund is, is working and supporting the, the countries. And one key element is that the, the, the joint SDG fund is also to support the UN, uh, the UN reform that is to for the UN to be much more uh, have, have much more impact supporting the countries and so how agencies can work together. So the, there is the RC system, the wrestling coordinator system, in which uh, it, it, is, uh, it is an office it has instrument to support in each in the country to support the UN agencies present to be more more uh, have more impact. So uh, the joint SDG fund programs and projects are led by the government and together with the RC, the wrestling coordinator of the U. Just to finalize this first part that is about the joint SDG fund, and before going to the example of Cabo Verde program, uh, just to, there is there is some some areas that I saw you before, some areas of investment for the joint SDG fund, and one of them was specifically uh, uh, dedicated to to six countries, so to small island development state countries, and you have here a map of of some of the, of the countries that we are uh, supporting. So going to the to the Cabo Verde joint joint program initiative that is about sustainable, integrated, and inclusive financial framework. I would like to to, to present to you that uh, this this program has the objective to identify, mobilize, and align financial flows with the SDG accelerator that the country has identified. In Cabo Verde, we have, we have five SDG accelerators. It's the human capital. The blue economy, the water uh, and water energy nexus. We also uh, have the digital transformation and the body and the value added change supporting the the sustainable tourism. So the idea is to to have a a, a, a broad view of what are the financial flows that are coming to the to the country or that the country ha, can, can use an access in order to align them to the SDGs. We are using a, a methodology, a framework that is called the Integrated National Financing Framework, or INFF, and that is a government-led framework to provide all stakeholders with a comprehensive understanding of the financial development of the growing financial landscape to better allocate the ESDG. So in Cabo Verde, we the the, the IFF has four main blocks, and we have been implementing it in the country. The first one is an assessment and diagnosis of the development finance uh, uh, of the of development finance, and we, it's already done here. Second, with that assessment, you, uh, the government is is uh, creating, building the financial the financing strategy. Uh, in Cabo Verde, the, the, the Sustainable National Development Plan is called PETS in Portuguese. So the PETS DOI uh, has just been formulated, and we are uh, we are supporting the country because the country is in the moment of uh, uh, of finalizing finalizing the, the the financing strategy. And next week we have a great uh, international partners event in Boavista in one of the islands. One of the nine along nine and nine to mobilize the resources necessary for, for implementing them. Then we have the monitoring and review process, and then the governments uh, the, the, the governments and uh, coordinate. Cabo Verde has 
99% uh, of the of the country is, is water because it's 800,000 square kilometers of, of, of the ocean with just 4,000 uh, 4, square kilometers of land in, in the Netherlands. So with, with this, with, with this uh, um, analysis, um, uh, it's something that, 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 is, uh, that the government is doing, we are supporting, we are, we must concentrate Okay, where are the the the, the, the flow, where is the finance flow coming from? Whether it's domestic or international, whether it's public or private, so we map it and we identify which are the the most catalytic for, for the development of our benefit, that is the sustainable finance um, instrument that, that you can see on the screen. And as an example of this process, we 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 support development. Uh, as uh, the BlueX platform. The BlueX pla platform is a sustainable finance, finance platform providing innovative development financing solutions. Okay, so but focuses on just for the blue economy. Uh, it, it's been led by the by one of the UN agencies, UNDP, United Nations Development Program, together with some other agencies supporting, and uh, in a partnership with the Cabo Verde Stock Exchange. It's a very small stock exchange. But we have been part partnering as well with the Luxembourg Stock Exchange that has a lot of experience on 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 sustainable finance. And right now we have we, we have already raised over 28 million uh, US dollar in capital markets for specific programs that are aligned with the SDG and with the national strategy. Most of them is coming from domestic, uh, private, and uh, pri uh, private person and, and, and companies. Some of them diaspora, and we are now uh, looking for international private entities and finance. So this, this is the experience I wanted to serve with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio. That was again what a good summary for joint SDG funds, especially for our listeners when you are. Um, Firstly, listening about this, because uh, what is joint SDG? You know, you have SDG 14 and you have SDG 8. Yes, we want to join them, but they belong to different governance systems. As you know, SDG 8 may be under the ILO, International Labor Organization. Number of targets are of ILO governance. SDG 14, again, dis distributed across multiple UN agencies. So the task ahead is huge by trying to coordinate them, but what is the token? What is that token? And that token we are hearing today from our speakers is about bringing integrated national financing frameworks together. That's sort of a key message, but that has been brought by our listeners. And our third speaker was is going to speak on uh, later on blue economy. Um, but what I'm going to do is, uh, since one of my speaker has to leave, I'll take some questions from our listeners. Um, at this point, before we move to the last component, which is blue economy. And if our listeners don't have the questions, then I, as the uh, moderator, will shoot some questions to my uh, uh, panelists. So while you are thinking and while we are getting some questions, um, this is to uh, Farida and Krishnan is, um, you know, working on island nations and Malmo experience, uh, though it's at local government level and um, Sejo, you have brought seeds together. So the focus of joint SDG or bringing integrated financing is uh, uh, heavily local government or governments and budgets. And um, today's session is focused heavily for what can island nations learn. I feel definitely that Malmo experience is a way to learn from there by any other small island nation. And if to remind it to our listeners is that Sweden and Fiji were one of the hosts in 2017 Ocean Conference, pushing a lot of about this joint SDG funding climate issues. 
So to my speakers, maybe a little bit of uh, your comment, how an exchange learning between your projects can be more beneficial moving forward in terms of capacity building. You know, if we have to train new policy makers, how do you think that your projects could be something that we can bank on? Perida, do you want to go ahead? Um, well, yes, I'm sh I'm convinced that we need to um, we need the local examples, but the local level is also always dependent on the national and global level. So, joining forces and and making, I mean. Yeah, uh, the local level need uh, to learn from from the UN, from uh, different uh, stakeholders. So I think we should definitely be clo worked closer together, and also for new policymakers, um, arrange sessions where we give all these uh, advice and examples from different levels. I guess to to really show that these SDGs are interdependable and uh, non-separable, and all countries, all nations, all uh, levels need to to work together. So I, I think it's a we it, it's not a question of if but we need to do it the question is how so, what's your comment krishnan ready if i can go next so um the program that uncdf uh, is implementing so there are multiple programs in the pacific small island developing states that uncdf implements one is of course there's a blue economy program which my colleague uh, sergio mentioned uh, it's uh, it, it it has its origins in the SDG fund, because the initial uh, design of the program, uh, which is now uh, through the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, was done through the SDG fund, which led to the Global Fund for Coral Reef support to the tune of uh, 10 million for stimulating the blue economy uh, in in the in the Pacific, so largely in Fiji. So there is there is a complementary approach uh, to that extent. The second thing is that you now uh, um, what UNCDF has been doing uh, in the Pacific, you know, given the challenges of hard to reach populations, is a very strong digital element in all our interventions. So some of uh, the viewers and listeners from Fiji may not know that uh, the popularity of MPISA and MyCash, both these were projects supported by UNCDF with the PGCell and Vodafone. So if you have the convenience of paying for your grocery or paying for your uh, food uh, i mean paying for your uh, for your bills uh, through uh, through mobile money it's uh, it's uh, it's it's because of the collaborative work that we did with the private sector so uh, as i showed you in my presentation that one deck on the on the ecosystem approach that we have is a testimony to to sdg 17 on partnerships because we strongly feel that any other SDG has uh, a direct uh, uh, sort of relationship with SDG 17, where it's very important that partnerships are the key to drive uh, any results. So in terms of localization of SDGs, uh, I'm happy to say that you know, UNDP already has uh, a, an ongoing project in the Pacific, in, uh, in Fiji multi-country office, uh, on localization of SDGs in a very participative manner with the respective national and subnational governments across the Pacific. And this takes into account uh, what is possible or what is not possible, the challenges and the, and the opportunities, as well as the, the, the technical capacities of each country. Because it's, 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 not, it's not practical to ask each country to achieve all the SDGs. It's, you know, that's, that's, the, that's a non-starter. So they will have to choose that what is good for their development agenda and what aligns well with their national development plans. And then we integrate that. Uh, we sort of, you know, I, I mean, I won't say retrofit, but we uh, co-create what is possible in the respective markets using their own resources uh, and using localized resources. And that's that's the way forward. And that's exactly what Thank we have been you. doing in our climate risk as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think few things that has been brought in here is that um, high priority SDGs. Countries have to prioritize which as jointly, which SDGs they would like to kind of tackle based on their needs. Um, but I think both of our speakers have highlighted that uh, after setting the priorities, it's a matter of strategy and 
the whole concept of SDGs is it is already a negotiated policy context. And so um, that's what Sejo has highlighted. Right after SDGs, he brought in, it is integrated policy making mechanism. If one has to understand and say, what is SDGs? It is a tool to integrate policy making. Now, what do you say, Sejo, on that? Over to you. Thank you very much. I just want to reinforce what both Frida and Christian has already said, uh, maybe focusing on two key messages. The first one is SDG cannot be achieved without the, the, the local level involved, the, 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 the cities, the municipalities, the towns. And this is already recognized by the government, it's already recognized by the UN. And so localizing SDGs is, the, is, a, is a key element. Now, as Frida was saying, the national framework, policy framework is very, very important, but you cannot do it without the, the localization. So, so that's why it's, so, it's such an important uh, element about the, the, the global movement of, of local entities, about, about how at national level and at, at local level, uh, uh, civil society organizations are, uh, are engaged. And as you say, is where the, the different SDG are, are, are joining, are coming together, because you cannot, you cannot say, okay, I'm gonna just uh, eradicate stem poverty, SDG one, without working on SDG eight, that is about the same work, or without working on SDG thirteen. I mean, it, it's all, all already done. That's the first uh, message. The second message is that at the UN level, as my colleague Christian was saying, it's, 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 it's recognized and we are working together to support the, the local entities, the cities and communities. They, they have been created this. A mechanism that is called Local 2030, that is bringing all agencies together in order to be at, at the at, at the service and of the support to the to the cities and communities in order to support them achieving the localization of the city. Thank you. Thank you. And now I would like to thank all my panelists uh, for giving your insights. A few questions that has come on um, on our chat: How can these SDGs goals be met? At what level has the SDG reached at the Pacific region? I think you have tackled the answers. Yes, you know, it depends how, which country, what they are prioritizing. And uh, it has to be contextualized, firstly. Local context, cultural identities, their values are very critical. But at the same time, we have to implement SDGs because they are already agreed way to move uh, government's new policy making. So now to our third speaker or the last speaker, which talks about blue economy, and uh, we will move into that. He discusses what capacity can be um, is needed by governments. And Sejo highlighted towards his end presentation, blue economy is where island nations are headed towards. So stay tuned with us. We will be getting the recorded listeners uh, speakers uh, to you. And uh, you'll hear on uh, capacity building on blue economy. Dear Jason, thanks for joining us today uh, for your session. Could you help us understand how can island governments build their public policy capacity in the era of blue economy development? Yeah, so thank you for the opportunity to, to share some thoughts on this topic. So we're, you know, at the Center for the Blue Economy, we've been thinking uh, about this a lot. And, you know, the small island developing states and island development states are quite varied, right? All across the different wor the world with different governance structures, different natural resources, different kind of industrial sectors. So there's, you know, a lot of that is going to depend on the individual actors. But there are some key kind of capacity building elements that we've been thinking about. So the first is a basic understanding kind of the measurement of the blue economy. And so that's something that we've been doing, you know, for 25, 30 years at the center uh, through the National Ocean Economics Program. And now all around the, the world, there are kind of countries that are building these kind of ocean economic accounts to really understand the employment impacts, the income, the GDP associated with different blue economy sectors. So I think kind of setting up some base measurement. Now, of course, also this needs to be coupled with some baseline scientific measurement. 
of marine biodiversity and habitats, et cetera. So this is not trivial, right? This kind of, and we, I get it. Some governments have, you know, with, you know, with budgets, this is, this is expensive stuff, but we think that it's important to set some baseline kind of fundamentals. Then the next kind of thing is to think about, you know, the typical kind of industrial sectors that most small island developing states are thinking about, which is, you know, obviously coastal tourism, obviously um, fishing and extractive resources, obviously offshore energy, and thinking about these in a blue economy framework, right? So how can these be done in a way that's regenerative, that's sustainable, that's socially equitable? And we're creating a bunch of kind of workshops and case studies to help governments start thinking about what are the questions to ask and the ways to, to balance trade-offs so that you can come up with a process that really points towards blue economic development and blue growth. And so there's a lot of specifics to be worked out here. And again, I'm talking kind of at the 10,000 foot level here, but I think that's just the first, you know, first cut, I think, to think about it from, um, from, a, from an island uh, nation's standpoint. Thank you. That takes me to a second question at this uh, time you know, with labor force and blue economy being uh, proposed as one of those uh, shifts that islands are making towards. Now, the demand side is requesting human capital, right? Labor skills. What should economic policy makers know about this, like certain capacity building areas, because it is a very new uh, area for our labor force? Yeah, that's a good point. And that really, again, kind of speaks to what we're trying to develop. And I'm not trying to just advertise our own work here. By the way, our work is just in the beginning stages. We're going to be, you know, seeking input from, from nations around the world, both island states and, and, and just states with large coastal populations. And in fact, members of this, you know, this conference, we want your opinion. And so again, this survey that we're going to be sending around is for this capacity building to kind of help us figure out that the key parts but i would say again a couple some of this is 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 is, is repetitive but the the measuring the ocean economy is a little different than measuring the regular economy it shares a lot of characteristics but there are certain measurement challenges that i think are important the next thing is also again this baseline scientific information this is just incredibly important just for biodiversity fish stocks ocean acidity sea level rise and so where i'm where i'm coming in with this is a, a lot of issues of climate right the, you know economic policy makers if you're planning economic development over decades you really need to understand how climactic patterns are going to be changing your ecosystem water temperature sea level again acidity currents biodiversity patterns this stuff is incredibly important just to give an example you know in the u.s in the Northeast, you know, many the, the 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 main lobster fishery is a world famous fishery. That's changing a lot in a couple dimensions. A lot of the the lobsters are moving north. They're moving up into Canada. They're also moving out to deeper waters. That puts them in conflict with potentially right whales, which are a critically endangered species because of the traps that have um you know that have these long cables that they can get entangled with. So understanding climate. Think about understanding population distribution, economic impacts, how the this key harvested species will interact with other species that might be critically endangered. And then we bring in the role of technology. This is a kind of maybe the final piece I'll add right now is a basic awareness of the kind of the new industrial sectors that are being developed. So to bring back the, the main lobster fishery, there's a whole new um, type of technology being developed on ropeless fishing gear where traps can be set at the bottom of the ocean and then they can be geolocated with GPS and then, a, and then a button pressed and they can rise to the surface with a flotation device. So that means they don't have to have a cable and those cables then are the things that entangle whales. These are obviously more expensive. They're in development of technology, but we think this can be a good way to help preserve fisheries and also prevent whale entanglement. So I think economic policymakers are never going to have the full, you know, panoply of new technologies, but they should be aware of the stuff going on in aquaculture, the stuff going in floating offshore. 
win. The, the stuff going on, living shorelines to help build up marine coastal ecosystems that protect from storms, but also build resilience and biodiversity. So I just think we're trying to create a some coursework around this to give people a flavor for the new technologies that are going to be part of the mix in the new blue economy. Thank you, Jason. I really like the fact that you have touched the role of uh... Uh, 21st century industry innovation and technology that will be the front uh, liner to decide, you know, how island nations will be able to extract things, right, or protect it. One of the key Okay, so as you are hearing that and when we are going into the blue economy industry innovation uh, partnership with government academia is highlighted as uh, uh, crucial aspects of uh, moving towards the capacity building. Now, um, there's few interesting questions uh, with us and based on the time, we have three minutes to our session. I wanna re uh, bring this question, which is really interesting and clarify and any of my speakers can join us. The difference between I, which is inclusive SDGs and SDGs. So basically, let me put the word inclusivity in the UN context. And in the context of where experts or decision-making is not uh, being taken in consideration by having all the right stakeholders or people that are needing to have been involved. So SDG 10, uh, which talks about equity, all of that really highlight the concepts of inclusivity. Most of the SDG text, if you're going to go in it, they are, especially the social SDGs, uh, you know, the ones that are on poverty, even SDG 8 speaks heavily about uh, ensuring that grassroots communities or in terms of this field, labor, labor force has to be involved in blue economy discussions. If they're not included in this, then the designing of policy making is not moving forward. So uh, these are some of the, the things that we have touched today. And um, uh, yes, governments can hinder or governments can make SDG progress. Uh, hinders come mainly from finance as you, are, you heard today about. Um, so, if we have a few minutes, James, then we can finish the uh, uh, Jason's uh, video. He speaks a little bit about inclusivity in there. And um, then we can finish the session in an hour, extra five minutes. A flavor for the new technologies that are going to be part of the mix in the new blue economy. Thank you, Jason. I really like the fact that you have touched the role of uh, uh, 21st century industry innovation and technology that will be the front uh, liner to decide, you know, how island nations will be able to extract things, right, or protect it. One of the key things that you have highlighted about climate change and climate risk, right, in determining the economic policy. And this is the core of this session is, you know, factoring in the economics, the climate risk and how much those cost. Now, as you know, that climate change and we have many denials and we have not been able to get into many negotiations and positions, uh, you know, especially island nations. And therefore it takes us to the macro level, right? Convening policy service at the macro level hereby, I'm meaning the UN and many others. I understand that you're, you have also been highlighting and preparing the workforce in this arena, you know, so that policy advisors are not just getting national or regional, but uh, should be aware of the capacity at the macro level. Can you help me a little bit talk about how you're preparing capacity building, particularly for UN missions or, you know, the new generation of negotiators on blue economy? Yeah, so just to be clear, you know, most of our work on climate risk has been either at the kind of the local, regional, or national level. We haven't done a ton of 
at the international level. And, and the reason, just to be clear, is for making decisions about the blue economy, it's really the micro that's the most important. Because we can talk about sea level rise and, and you know rising ocean acidity, but those are not distributed equally around the world. And there's island states that are going to see sea level rise and some that might be in parts of the world where they don't see almost at any at all. There's going to be some island states that are have local hot spots of ocean acidity and somewhere it's not a big problem, right? So I guess I, the, the, the point I'd like to kind of maybe is flip it on the head here is that all nations, whether they be island states or not, are going to really need as much fine-tuned, detailed information first on the kind of the, the, the expected climate impacts and then processes to do two things. One is to think about how that comes into long-term planning, but also in an adaptive management context because these things are going to be updated all the time. We're not going to be able to tell you how much sea level is going to rise in 20, 30 years. We have a prediction with a margin of error. But in five years, we're going to have a more precise. And so we need mechanisms. And so a lot of the stuff we're working on is adaptive management so that we can always bring in the latest available data. So, so again, at the, you know, at the macro level, we don't think the climate stuff is that important at the micro, macro level, especially for small island states. You really need what is affecting your region, your ecosystem, your coast. Thank you. Um, help us also uh, seek some awareness of your program where your students get attached to permanent missions of island nations. And uh, how does that work? And what's your future vision uh, in terms of capacity building in this arena? Yeah, so our students, you know, we have a, well, a specialization in our program called o Ocean and Coastal Resource Management. And a lot of students have been really fascinated with kind of, you know, um, island states and their development. We had a, a student from Mauritius, Azara. She's at the Waite Foundation right now. We've had other students who, again, come from island nations. We have a student right now from Bermuda. And so she's kind of thinking about really islands. So it mostly comes from the students. If, if they're interested in it, we have a big network. We help them fine tune their studies. We have fellowships, internships. So after two years, they have a pretty you know, sophisticated expertise on on kind of the capacity and the needs of, of island states, sometimes specifically one island state. If, for example, if it's their, their 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 nation of birth and they really want to focus on that, or it might be a region like the South Pacific. I have a student right now who's really interested in the South Pacific. So he's working on a bunch of things for, for you know, a constellation of, of kind of island um, nations in that region. So so we just it's barely student driven. Um, our students, you know, come from all walks of life from around the world, and we have our curriculum is very flexible so that we can help them develop that expertise. Thank you. I think, uh, as you see, this is the current needs of policymakers, and our job is here to kind of connect where capacity is and research extension to to governments and policymakers. So that take us to uh, the next question is like. Yeah, we are aware now that, okay, these students or these researchers are working very hard. And how can we help to kind of link their research to, to governments so they are more getting more exposure and they are able to work with them in the current times? Uh, do you also think that, uh, you know, having that connection with uh, infield government public policy helps to really... Uh, engage the research extension between academia, government, and industry. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's our model. What you've just outlined is completely our model. So, you know, we have a two-year master's program, and in during that time, the students have a summer internship, or called we call the, the the Center for Blue Economy summer fellowships. They have a professional practicum in their last semester, and then they also work as research assistants throughout the academic year. So they have three or four professional um, relationships and experiences, <clears throat> excuse me, during the two years. And we have, a, we work with a lot of governments, a lot of organizations, and we would love it if more island states wanted to bring our students in. And so, you know, I would say just reach out to me directly. If you have um, that need, we have, you know, we could just put talk to, you know, what type of projects you want, what type of skills you're looking for. 
We have funding to pay for most of this. Obviously, if there's some travel involved, people want to be in country. We we usually seek some money for that from the external organization. But most of these things are internally funded, and uh, we would love to have more direct exposure to you know the, the direct needs of, of island states. Thank you. I think uh, for our platform, this is the first time we are engaging with you guys, and it's, it's such a pleasure to to share that. And I think uh, to my listeners, this will be great uh, moving forward as we have been discussing over COVID, like you know the blue economy and stuff like this. But 2023 allows people to now get get on the ground and start moving. One very last and final question: it, It's more about you know equity and uh, the the as you know, the the inclusivity concepts and uh, how do we integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion in the blue economy training programs? Uh, is this something yeah. that you can uh, give us some comments on? Well, yeah. So this is a you know this is a, a perennial issue, right? The environmental policy in the United States is very dominated by white you know people in America. We we actively recruit people from you know from around the world. For example, this year. We got two Fulbright students. We got one from Chile and one from Congo. So the Fulbright program is a really great way to increase diversity in American higher education. In this training program that we're developing, we are putting that front and center. So we are going to be trying to get major you know, organizations like the UN, like the GEF, like the World Bank, and maybe some big foundations to help fund this. And we are going to specifically request the funding go to tuition for, you know, for diverse, for a diverse group, um, both in terms of gender and also for ethnic diversity. And so all of the work we're doing is in that direction. And we've been really fortunate that we have had, again, we've had a lot of success in that. We have a lot of students where that we're attracting to the program. We have some small scholarships, et cetera, but this is, this is work we all need to do. Um, and, you know, we just need to make the economic opportunities available and, and the people will come. Thank you very much. And uh, with this, I'm going to wrap my session and uh, we'll move to the next speaker. All right. Thank you. And please, thank anyone who wants to reach out to me, please, uh, you know. Thank you so much, Zadie, for that fantastic session was really really great to um see that range of speakers and thank you for bringing Jason on I know the time zone he was not able to join us live although he would have would have liked to with that we will wrap up this session and I will let you know um about the next session coming up in a few hours uh bridget bridging the digital divide the role of technology in the set success of esg sorry bit of a mouthful there that's coming up at 8 30 a.m eastern time uh 1 30 p.m london time or 10 30 p.m sydney so a little bit late for those of you in the pacific uh but maybe some of you will make it that'll be a shorter one-on-one -on -one, uh interview uh with zia payton who's an esg expert from pwc in trinidad and tobago uh so with that i'll say thank you very much to all the speakers it's a great session and we'll see you in the other sessions during the rest of the forum have a great rest of your day and goodbye